microphone working okay? Right. Brilliant. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction. Hello everyone. I hope you're fine, not too hangoverish from yesterday evening. Who was out yesterday evening? I know you were. <laughs> no? Okay, that's good. Um, let me see. Oh, it doesn't work. Now. Um, right. Just need to replace that. All righty. There you go. So here comes the first advice. Always be prepared. No, seriously, um, that's something very handy. You should always have a presenter tool with you. Right? Kind of like, you know, you don't need to stand here and do things, but you can wander around. Sorry? I can what? OK, so should I stay here like that? I think you know there are not that many people. I can probably directly speak to people. Okay, so it's kind of weird to stand under that, but anyways, uh, I, I, I tried to come up with a sensible title for that talk, and all I, I could come up with was a compass for applied research. Um, compass, why? Compass, well, you know, compass is a nice tool to give you orientation, right? Unknown terrain, you need to know where to go to. But, however, there are two more things you need in addition to that compass and that are on the one hand you need to know the goal, you need to know in which direction to head, right? Where is the goal? And where you need to start, right? So I can't help you with the form of the letter, I can just give you the, the compass, the tool that might enable you to do things. And so that's me and my tagline. And in data integration using linked data, open data, and REST, and NoSQL, cloud computing, yada, yada, um, also contributing to Apache. And yeah, as the tagline says, I'm proud father of three, so we have three children, and I'm very thankful to my wife that, you know, she also contributes to that. Without her, I wouldn't be able to do all these things there, right? And this slide really just serves one purpose. Uh, and that is to impress you and to build up credibility, right? So I'm slapping a number of things I've been doing over the last couple of years here, and then you will see, you know, yeah, whatever that guy here uh, in front of you is telling you is, you know, the truth. You have to believe me, right? So I've been doing Lattice, which was an EC support action for two years as a coordinator, trying to help people consuming and publishing linked data. And uh, I've been doing that uh, vocabulary, a vocabulary to describe data sets on the web. And uh, I'm blogging under webofdata.wordpress.com, where I kind of, you know, surface ideas, throw out things there, and trying to get reactions from the community. Does it make sense? Does anyone else, uh, you know, has anyone else had a, a look at that and so on? Uh, contributing to uh, a newly formed Apache. A group which is called uh, Apache Drill, a large-scale interactive um, system um, which we try also to apply uh, in the linked data setup. Uh, maintaining five-star data, uh, open, open data, which is an, an advocacy site essentially explaining Tim Berners-Lee's five-star plan to uh, publish linked data. Yeah, 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 probably. Mm. That better? Yeah. Right. Um, I'm contributing and, and participating in, in another EC project called uh, Lot2, which is all about um, building up a stack of, of uh, components for, for processing linked data. Um, another pr uh, project, another EC project called BIG, which is again a coordination action to establish big data in, in Europe. I'm developing, I'm hacking things like sparklebin.com or turtle.net or whatever. Um, if you look at my GitHub account, you'll see there are a number of repositories there. Why is that important? Well, you know, on the one hand, you, you know the technologies, right? So you can help others with that. On the other hand, it helps you to 
you know, build up a profile of your code and you make that code public. I'm maintaining schema.rdfs.org. Last year, the um, consortium around uh, schema.org, so Google and Yahoo and Bing and, and now Yandex came up with schema.org and we decided um, to come up with um, a kind of support site for that uh, that looks into how to bridge the gap between schema.org and the existing um, semantic web vocabulary such as FOF and, and, and good relations and so on. And last but not least, I'm doing books and book chapters and what else, right? So by now you should be very impressed, right? You go like, oh yeah, that guy really knows what he's talking about. No, I'm just kidding. So that's the compass. And as you know, each compass has these four directions, right? North, east, south, west. Very simple, very straightforward. Uh, I'm going to talk to each of these directions and pretty much like a real compass, sometimes these directions contradict each other, right? If you're trying to head in that direction, you can't in the same time head in the other, right? So that's the basic idea. Right. I think you've got to be nosy, right? In order to be successful, in order to um, establish a group, in order to uh, build up a profile, you really got to be nosy, right? In the sense of constantly asking why, right? Why is that happening? Uh, that helps you on the one hand to find research topics that might be within your thesis, right? Probably you're in the second year, you still might not have a topic, right? Who cares, right? I mean, that's the point. You've got to be nosy in order, you know, to find stuff, right? The rest is engineering, you know? Knowing how to set up HBase and knowing to model an ontology, whatever. That's engineering. That's, you can do that. You can learn that. You can learn it from a textbook or whatever. But no one can teach you being nosy, right? That's something, if you're not, you're probably not a researcher. You're probably not a scientist. You're an engineer. And I'm not saying that, you know, the one thing is good or the other thing is not so good or whatever. I call myself an engineer. But if you're not nosy, you're not a researcher. If you don't ask, why? Why is that happening? Here's my hypothesis. How could I set up an experiment to validate that hypothesis? You're not a researcher. You're an engineer. So be nosy. Try to figure out what is it in there that's new. And you can, whatever you take, whatever problem you have, you can always find the research aspect there. You can always ask, why is that happening? Does it make sense? And so on. Right? Does that kind of make sense to you? Being nosy, right? Anyone disagrees with being nosy? <laughs> Okay. The second direction, which probably is my favorite, is explain. Right? And because we are researchers, we're going to do an experiment now. You got three sentences or less and ten seconds to explain what you're doing. We're starting here. Please. That was a bit more than three sentences, but okay. Next. Uh, I'm working on contextual layer uh, and ubiquitous system and orientation on precisely on the e-learning system and uh, tourism. Okay, thanks. I'm trying to interpret natural language uh, queries from user and translate them in format queries to query graph based uh, knowledge queries. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm trying to uh, retrieve Okay. I'm trying to create a way to preserve the digital music to retrieve the relevant information to understand how to preserve the well in the music. Okay. My goal would be to make automated agents search the web like we humans do today. And for that I am semantically describing web APIs. Okay. Since I think uh, we know Okay. Open matching 
Okay, you can speak up a bit, yeah, yeah. So I'm researching how agents can resolve their ontological differences in an open environment. Right, right, okay. I'm trying to understand the scientists, how they read and how they research uh, scientific documents to help them develop some uh, new model and tools to mm. research precise questions in scientific documents. Very good. I'm trying to uh, build a, a large knowledge repository based on uh, the um, linking different or generalities uh, that are knowledge resources in this level. Okay, Hugo? Hugo? You're with us? You're with us? What are you doing? Your research topic, what, what are you doing? You, you just speak up a bit. It's, it's. I don't know what the noise is, but. Sorry, I, I didn't hear anything. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I think you all have deserved a round of applause. Huh? You can applaud yourself. Very good. No, seriously, I think, um, I think I'm done, right? I mean, that's it, right? You, you are all very good at capturing what you're doing. Um, I sometimes didn't really hear to what purpose, right? So you're, you're telling me, you know, you're building X, you're researching Y or whatever. Right? Why in the sense of why, not why. Um, the question then is, you know, like, why? <laughs> why? Why is that important? Where is the impact? Um, and that's part of the explain, which is, you're doing great work, but does the world know about that? Can you explain that not only to me or your peers, can you explain that to your grandmother, if she's still alive, or to your mother? Um, can you explain that to an investor, can you explain that to a potential employer? Can you explain that to your girlfriend or your boyfriend? So this explain thing, that has really two aspects. One thing is, you're doing great stuff, talk about it, sell stuff, right? And then the other aspect really is, whatever you're doing, be it a paper, be it a project proposal, whatever, a talk, there must be some kind of story behind that, right? We are all trained, you know, how to write a paper, right? It comes up with, here is the hypothesis, and here is, you know, some experiment, and here is how I validate that, and here are the conclusions, and yada, yada. But what's the story? What is the key thing that goes throughout the paper that attracts someone, that says some, someone looks at that and says, oh, cool, I really want to, you know, read that and cite that paper. The same is true for proposals. Who of you has been in kind of engaged already or, or involved in proposal writing? Right? Few, right? So this is really essential. If you want to build up something, a group or whatever, you've got to have some money, right? You need to write proposals and they better be successful. So what do you think, what's the average success rate in EC project proposals? Any ideas? How many of them get through? How many percent? Any guesses? Five percent? Yeah, roughly. A few percent. So two, three, four, depending on the call and, and so on. But I mean, isn't that it's a huge waste of time, isn't it? Right? So we, we go there and invest weeks, uh, different partners writing 120 pages, submit it, and then only 5% or less get accepted. 
right? And you probably have already experienced that with papers, right? You submit a paper, you think that's, that's really the paper, right? You should be accepted, you deserve it. But you don't, you don't get accepted, right? So sometimes, I'm not saying that, you know, you shouldn't focus on the quality of, of your work, you should neglect the hypothesis, you should neglect the experiments, whatever. But on top of that, you really want a story that works. And if you don't have the story, I claim you might have a good paper, you might have done good work, but you're not selling it right. So think about the next time when you write a paper or a proposal or give a talk, you have to have a story. A story that makes sense, not only to you, but to your friends. And, you, know, you might want to show the paper to your peers, you might want to give the talk within your institute or whatever, and test if the story works. Right? If that, if that happens, if you have a story, you're almost there. Right? Assuming you have done good work and you have a story, success is pretty close. Now, what's next? Sustain. So, sustain is really something hard, especially in the beginning. But think of it, whatever you're doing, that could be a um, piece of software, that could be an algorithm uh, somewhere not, not implemented, that could be a vocabulary, that could be um, what, whatever you produce. Let's call it an asset, right? You have these assets and over the time you're building your assets, right? And then you want to sustain them, you want to exploit your assets. And how could that work? How, how would you imagine you have three or four assets that could be, you know, as I said, software, that could be a vocabulary, that could be one of these uh, advocacy sites I've, I've shown you earlier on. Um, how, any ideas, how could you sustain these? Or is the, the, the concept of sustaining something uh, familiar to you? Have you thought about sustaining your work, your assets? Any ideas? Exactly. So you start off with, you know, nicely packaged, nicely documented, and so on. And then, what what do you need? I mean, let's assume you're writing a wonderful vocabulary and a wonderful tool that does something visualization or acquisition or whatever. And that's the part of your PhD thesis, right? You're done. You move on. You're a postdoc now. What do you do with that? You throw it away, or? Yes, so exactly, using it in proposals, of course. That's the, the most obvious thing you can do, right? You've built something and now you're going to use it, right? Because research never ends and you can always find some new aspects there. Right? Um, if you think about communities, be it Apache, be it coming up with your own workshop at a conference, be it whatever, it could be on, really could be on Facebook, it doesn't matter. Communities. You can build a community <coughs> around your assets. So, for example, if you have a vocabulary, like we did with, with the void vocabulary, um, you know, a vocabulary, that's nice, right? You know, everyone can do that. You can write a vocabulary, put it there. But then how do you make people, how do you convince people that this is worth investing time, right? To use your vocabulary, to write tools for your vocabulary. The simple insight there is you don't scale and I don't scale either, right? As a single person, you don't scale. You can't handle, you know, your day and a day only has 24 hours. And some of them probably should uh, be dedicated to sleep or party, drink, whatever. But you don't scale. So you typically want to build a community around your assets. So as I said, for a vocabulary, you could probably go to W3C, right? You go there, very cheap to create a community group. You put it there trying to attract people. They come along and think, oh, that's great, I have a use case for that. I want that vocabulary to describe my data. Or you go to Apache, you pick one of the existing projects, or you might be able to bootstrap a new project there. And again, you build community. 
And by that, you're creating a critical mass around that, which means it lives on beyond what you can contribute. Right? And that's the, the essence there. If you can't make it happen that you build up a community, then it's not sustainable because you might move on. You, you know, might move to a new job, you have new research interests, whatever. But if you have identified that as an asset that you can exploit, then you need to have, that's a very strong claim, but I, I really believe that, that you need to have a community around that. And that community in the first step could be, you know, within your institute, some colleagues. Or you're using a conference like this one, in the coffee break, in the evening, to team up with your peers, right? To get someone else involved and get someone else interested in your stuff, right? And by that, you build a community. And if you, again, that's a really essential point. If you don't build up that community, if, you, if you're not able to get it out there beyond the pure selling part, right? The explanation part, as we heard earlier on, that's important. But you need to bootstrap that people around your asset that are able and are willing to carry it on and to broaden it, to use it in different you know, use cases, to contribute code or documentation or whatever. Right? So sustaining, although it sounds simple, is really it's a, a long-term process really. And it's also something you have to explicitly address. Right? So these things don't happen. But the other things like you know nosy you might have already heard and, and probably your supervisor or whoever told you that already in terms of you know, doing your PhD. And explaining you know, how to give presentations and how to write papers and so on, that's also a typical part of your um, PhD. However, the sustaining bit, at least as far as I've experienced it so far, is typically not an explicit element of your education. And uh, so my hypothesis there is it's partly because people who supervise you might not themselves you know, got it. They, they might not have self, themselves experienced that either because there was no need, right? If there is funding, if, if I'm you know, um, employed by the university and I don't need to pull in my own money, what's my incentive to you know, <laughs> uh, build a community, whatever, because I'm getting paid anyways. Um, in our case, in Derry, we are 100% soft funded, which means I need, in order to sustain my group, which is currently around 10 people, I need to constantly pull in new money. That can be on the national level, that can be directly industry funded, that can be EU level projects or whatever. But the sustain, sustainability part, the part where it comes to using existing assets and building up these assets, um, and successfully deploying that in proposals, in papers. Um, also, within, within an academic setting, it's then probably pretty straightforward. Imagine yourself being a postdoc now, and you've got two PhD students. Well, what you can do, pretty straightforward, is you assign these two assets to each of the two uh, PhD students, and they kind of you know, push the boundaries there. So, just to sum up again, Sustainability is probably, of these, these four, um, the most important one in terms of building up your career and having an impact, right? Otherwise, it's really something very short-lived and you probably wonder, you know, where is that all going, right? You're doing a lot of work and so on, and, uh, but where is that leading? What, what's the impact? What's the the part that um, you know stays around, even if you have moved on into into a different uh, direction. Um, so far, everything okay and everything clear. Please do interrupt me if anything is unclear or if you want to discuss things. Right, I'm I'm here for discussion. Right. So um, now this is something, although it sounds kind of like simple, uh, of course you have to work and work hard. So I'm not saying that you know you have to work long, long hours. You know, sometimes with, with a couple of, of uh, my or in, in Derry with the PG students, I see people working very long hours, right? So they come in at 10 
and work till two o'clock in the morning. No. So I, I don't believe in that. I, I, I'm very uh, lucky and I'm very thankful for that, that uh, I have a family and are trying to be off at five o'clock. Why is that? Because it forces me to do the work within these, you know, more or less nine to five job, right? The problem we have as knowledge workers, who, who has heard about the term knowledge workers? Peter Drucker? Yeah. Fadi over there. So Peter Drucker, a management guru, I think he died only recently in, in his 90s, um, came up with that concept of knowledge worker. So in contrast to people who um, work, for example, in, um, in a plant and do manual work, you know, work with their hands and put together things, assembly line or a cashier or whatever, doing manual work, right? Um, all of us here are knowledge workers. So we work with our brain. Of course, we are using tools like that to, you know, express ourselves, to exchange stuff and to whatever. But at the end of the day, we're working with that and only with that. Now, here comes the problem. You can't easily switch off the brain. Right? So, whereas if you're working in a factory, you can go home at five and you're done. You're not taking some of these parts with you and assemble them at home, right? You don't. But as a researcher, you're a knowledge worker, which means your brain will continue to work on that. No matter if you're in the shower or you're doing, you know, you're watching TV or whatever, your brain will continue to work on that. Now, how to, how to kind of bridge that gap or how to, to balance that. So on the one hand, I just told you early on, don't work long hours. Don't do, you know, oh, and I can't hang out till two o'clock and that's so cool and so on. Um, you gotta have your life. And if you force yourself to a regular short day, that might be six hours, that might be eight hours, I can sort of promise you, you're much more both efficient and effective with your time. Who knows the difference between effective and efficient? Don't be shy. It's very simple. Which, which? Uh, the fact is, is uh, you get the right the good result, oh, sure. you accomplish your task, and efficient you do it uh, in a short time and um, in, uh, in a good way. Right, 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 yeah. So I, I prefer to say doing something efficient means I'm, I'm doing the thing right, right. And if I'm doing something effective, I'm doing the right thing. So this sounds pretty similar. As, as do effective and efficient. But it's a huge difference, right? So for example, you can be very, very efficient with your work. You know, you're using the right tools, you know how to do handle LaTeX and that and that and that. And you produce a wonderful paper within a week. You have been very efficient. But unfortunately, you have not been effective because you didn't do the right thing. Now, while it's sort of easy to train someone to work efficiently, you know, you can all the, you know, time management and learning your tools and whatnot else, right? You can work efficiently, no doubt about that. But how do you figure if you're doing the right thing, right? if you're doing something effective? That's really hard. I don't have a good answer to that, to be honest. Um, but typically, it makes a lot of sense to bounce off these ideas with your peers. So I have a, a colleague, Richard Ziganiak, with whom I built up the Link Data Research Center. And we constantly, probably once or twice a day, just come up with ideas and just by uttering them, by speaking them out aloud and by the face expression of the peer, you would go, oh, okay, no, that doesn't make sense. Other ways, again, that's why, it's, for example, I'm writing blog posts, is put it out there. Don't be shy. Put it out on a blog or mailing list or whatever that you might have in your research institute some way, I don't know, a mailing list or whatever, put it out there, test your idea. And by that, you get feedback, and it's not about, you know, oh yeah, what a stupid idea or whatever. It's, you know, some people might, might come up with things like, 
oh yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about that aspect. Or others might go like, oh yeah, look, you know, these people have already looked into that. Don't bother. Uh, in both cases, you should not give up. Because even if someone says, you know, oh no, no, that has been researched already. That's dead, right? You don't need to go there. Um, just take uh, Albert Einstein as a, as a good example. If he would have done that, you know, <laughs> probably we wouldn't be here uh, where we are today. So no matter what kind, what the, the sort of feedback is that you get, uh, the most important thing there is, again, to articulate your thoughts, to um, test your hypothesis in terms of describing that, you know, playing that against one of your peers, and you will get an idea um, is that something that could attract more people, coming back to uh, sustainability and so on, or is that something that only sounded good in your head, but once you say it aloud, once you trying to describe the idea or, or solution or whatever, uh, it actually turns out to be yeah, nothing that is worth uh, spending time on. Then once you have that, you typically really want to be efficient with your time. And that ties back into the working day, into this nine to five job, uh, where we try to kind of say, okay, the, the day has only shown so many hours and we, you know, if you, if you stop doing Facebook and stop checking your mail and stop, I don't know, playing Angry Birds or whatever, you're much more efficient. You force yourself to do the stuff that is really important and that improves something, it improves your skills, it gets you to the results, it you know, creates impact or whatever. But nevertheless, you've got to work hard, right? I mean, no one, even the lucky ones uh, I know, uh, got there because they are slackers or they didn't care or whatever. So luck alone is not enough, right? So you, work alone is also not enough, to be honest. But if you don't work hard at the, at the end of the day, you won't get things done and you won't have results. You won't be able to build up assets, right? Um, and, and as I already said, the, the luck part, that's something which is, of course, that's unpredictable, but quite often, and, and I can give you a number of examples there, um, the main reason why someone is successful is because he or she was at the right time at the right place. Now that's something um, you can't predict or you can't work towards that, but then you should be prepared. So if you are lucky, right, you are at the right time at the right place and you you didn't work, or you're not willing to work, or you're not prepared to take on that challenge. Again, you know, you could be lucky, but you don't realize it, or you don't have the skills and the, the power to pull through. So, summing up, work, try to be efficient and effective, um, and at the end of the day, you got to work hard. Now, there was one thing left in the middle you might have noticed, and that's the P. Anyone an idea what the P means? Patience. Sorry? Patience. Patience is also good, yeah. But patience is also kind of boring. What could the, you know, you're, you're working, right? You're working hard. You want to establish yourself in academia or industry or whatever. Second? People. People? Could also mean people, yes, yes, yes. You're you're in a team, right? Right? No. Yeah. But what I mean is party. <laughs> you're laughing, but it's very important. It's very. I'm, I'm not. I'm saying that really out of total convinced that if you don't party hard, if you don't know when to stop working, and that's you know a more politically correct term would be work-life balance, right? But first. I already used up the W, and second, that's, that's too long, right? Party is something you can just remember. Party does not necessarily mean, you know, you go out and on a binge and drink a lot and, and dance a lot. That's also good. I, I also like that. But it means there is something else other than work, right? And if you don't do that, if you don't party, if you don't switch off, and that's why it's really hard because we're knowledge workers, you might get up there very fast, but then you also will burn up there. And I know a number of colleagues in their late 30s, beginning 40s, who had nervous breakdowns, who had heart attacks, who
who are not able to do that, what they are supposed to do and what they want to do anymore. Because they've been working like hell, but they did not party. They did not switch off. They were not able to switch off. And that's the problem we have as, as knowledge workers. We work with our brains, and we cannot easily switch off. So again, if you have your friends, your family, your peers, it doesn't matter what and, or whom, you need to be able to switch off. You need to be able to go out there and for an hour, for an evening, for a weekend, switch it off. Do something completely different. And at least in my experience, and I, I'm pretty sure you, you, um, you have experienced that as well, if you step away from the work, right? You're going off for a holiday or, you know, partying hard or whatever. And you come back. You've got new insight because you're detached from the problem, right? You, you were facing, you were kind of really trying hard to solve there, right? Sometimes it's, it's as simple as switching off the computer at night. Next morning, you start with a fresh mind. You start with the most important things. You don't do emails in the morning. You do things when your mind is fresh. You do important things. You come up with a vision. You come up with a new idea. Things like that. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's, um, so we still have some 20 minutes left or, or whatever. And I'd like to use that time to discuss these things. So I intentionally kept my talk short because I really want to discuss with you because I don't believe in that kind of, you know, here is some guy who stands there and who tells the truth and everyone goes like, mm -hmm. but through that interaction, we might figure ways. So just one more slide, um, <laughs> which is very important, right? Okay, now let's discuss. Um, I'll leave that picture here because I like Yoda. Um, so we, early on we did that round with um, what, what are you currently doing, right? Now we do it again, try to emphasize something different. And you know, feel free if, you, if you're uncomfortable to skip, if you don't want to participate, fine, and just yeah, give a sign to move on to the next one. What, what you're trying, I'd, I'd ask you, I'd like to ask you, what you're trying to do now is, imagine you know, you're done with your PhD. Right? Your postdoc now. Identify your assets and come up now, impromptu, with a way how you sustain the whole thing, how you would build up a group. How, you know, if you would give, be given the chance, you know, now you are postdoc, starting somewhere else, how would you go about that? How would you build it up? Let's start here this time. Uh, speak up a bit. Uh, it's uh, okay. So it's about sustaining and sustaining work, right? The same work as the well, you have completed your PhD, right? So you have uh, probably one or two topics covered, you have developed some software, vocabulary, whatever, right? And that's your asset now. Now you're a postdoc and you're supposed to build up a new group, right? That's eventually what you want, want so to do. Actually, at least um, try to, to face the problem. <laughs> no, I think you're quite right. <laughs> yeah, you're quite right. Yeah. We cannot resolve everything in the, uh, uh, during the PhD process because there's a lot of things that are um, important uh, mm -hmm. and we have like um, we have to stay through the time because otherwise we're not finished. But there is a lot of problems that will come up and that are very, very important to solve and get that the tool or the thing Can you be more concrete? I mean, that was really, uh, you, I think you're right, but that was very generic bullshitting. Can you be a bit, <laughs> bit more concrete there? Yeah, I mean, concrete, I don't know. If I imagine I'm building the standards of divide the work and um, uh, try to, to go and find 
know, it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> At least during the interview process, you know the people you interacted with. Mm -hmm. You keep that contact. Mm -hmm. uh, at least, um, well, to have new members in your team, uh, right? It's, it's uh, almost uh, plausible that you will go through the people who have already also finished the interview. They work in the, in the field or in, uh, on the subject that is. Very important to do. Okay. Concretely, okay. to do things, uh, especially like select. Other PhDs would want to do the same with so they yeah. want to have their own team. So they right. would be able to look at smart master students. Okay. Yep. Okay. And um, then, then you can have a PhD next year. Right. 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 How, how about hiring? Anyone of you has hiring experience? Hiring people? How how you how you go about hiring? How do you identify good people? Internship. Sorry? Internship. Yeah, that's a very good way. So you want to work with people. Right. Right. It's that's one of the I'd like to expand a bit on that because I think that's very important. It's something which is typically not included in a PhD curriculum, right? They they don't teach you how to hire people. They teach you probably how to write a paper, how to, you know, apply methodology X or Y or whatever. But how to hire people. <laughs> Believe it or not, as a team leader, as a group leader, that is your first and most important activity. If you get the right people in place, you can delegate and you can, again, you don't scale, I don't scale. You need the people in, in place to delegate that you can focus on, on other things, on building up the group and getting more money in and whatever. So how, 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 do we, how do we hire? How do we identify that. I, I think you made a very good point. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Stefano. Okay. Stefano. Hi, Stefano. So yes, I think that's a, that's a brilliant way. So um, having someone around for an internship, three months, six months, whatever, um, because then you see how that person works and that person also gets a bit of a feeling, you know, about the environment as a whole. Is the, the place nice? Are the people nice? Interesting topics and so on. Um, if you are thinking, so quite often your teams will not only consist of academics, but also more on the engineering end. How do you go about engineers, about developers? How do you hire a developer? Any ideas? I give you a million euro and two year, uh, yeah, two years project. You got to hire people. How do you hire? And you know you need two developers. Back-end developer, front-end developer. How do you hire that person? Any idea? Now, the project starts tomorrow. You need to hire. Come on. <laughs> What's up? It really depends on the circumstances. I know that in my personal situation, we, we had some funding for some engineering. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky enough that we, uh, we knew some guy that was the, the perfect match for that because they already knew a bit of some of our research. Mm -hmm. They really knew the, the kind of technology we use. So okay, I think you have a key there. You knew that person. Very important. Knowing people. That can be through an intern or... <coughs> um, so yes, I think the, the key here is knowing people. Um, now, imagine for example our situation here in, in the west coast of Ireland. So, getting people moving over to Ireland, to the west coast of Ireland, is probably not that easy, right? So how do you, you know, on the one hand attract people, but then attract the right people? What else could there be? So, uh, c coming back to that um, E explain thing in terms of having publicly visible repositories online. Right? If someone comes to me and says, oh yeah, I'm a Java coder, I'm going to say, okay, you've got to show me some um, projects you've been working on. And that guy or that person better has a GitHub or whatever, I don't care which one, but some repository that are publicly available and they can look at the code that person has produced. Right? I mean, quite often you can't do that because it's kind of you know, closed software, you, you can't look at the code. But 
typically good developers also have some public artifacts somewhere visibly um, available, right? Or if someone comes along and says, oh yeah, and I've been working on that cool uh, project. It's not open source, I can't show you the source, I'm sorry. But then you can still ask, what exactly did you contribute there? What was your contribution in that project? And if that person can't explain that in a few simple words, it's a pretty good sign that that person probably, you know, yes, <laughs> formerly was a member of that project, but probably didn't contribute. Uh, attracting good people. How, how do you attract good people? So no doubt, if your institution has a good name, people will knock on your door and say, you know, <laughs> I'd like to do a master or a PhD or whatever. But now you're a postdoc, a good institution, a good place, and people come and uh, you know, knock on your door. And how do you attract the right kind of people? Any ideas, any suggestions? How would you do that? These are the essential questions that you will face as soon as you are in charge. As soon as you've you know, completed your PhD and you start running your own group, these are the kind of questions you typically, you know, you will face, you will have to resolve, right? So again, I'm not saying I can present kind of complete answers here, but one of the ways how to attract good people, I think, is, you know, you're leading by example, right? So you have something, again, that could be any kind of asset, it doesn't really matter, it depends on your domain and so on, it could be vocabulary, software, whatever you're doing. You're leading by example and Typically, if you have good visible examples out there, that could be a demo, that could be you know, a well-documented open source thing, doesn't matter. Um, people will stumble upon that and people who are good would typically come up with suggestions, right? They would look at that and say like, oh, by the way, did you think about extending your framework into that direction? Or, hey, I have some code here, uh, can I contribute to that? So, by establishing good examples, by, by leading by example, putting something out there, you typically also attract, and, and by being visible in that, in that sense, you attract people, you, people will stumble upon that through blog posts, through papers, through other peers, right? So I, I quite often do that. If I hear something, I hear your good work, right? So I would mention that to someone else, like, did you know about that person? He's really doing great stuff. And don't underestimate that. Although we all are used to and, and do a lot of blogging and twittering and Facebooking and whatnot else, this kind of personal, this face-to-face -face communication, right? This is really something heavy, something really that still has a lot of impact. While you know this endless stream of tweets and on Facebook and so on that kind of goes in here, goes out there, and you might bookmark something or might remember something. But face-to-face, -face, think back of the times where someone important, be it uh, one of your professors or it doesn't matter, face to face told you something. I bet you very likely remember that over anything else you read on Twitter or on a blog or whatever. And that's the very simple fact that because we are humans and we like to see each other's faces and like to see the expressions and the, the reaction of someone, that's something we take with us, right? And you can, of course, use that, right? If you want to get the word out, if you want to attract good people, well, then you better go to conferences, you go to whatever events, or you come up with your own events to talk to people face to face. Say again? You organize a hackathon or something. You need a hacking event. Yeah. Exactly, that's a very good example. A very good example. We, we did that uh, in terms of, of open data or, or other things, building applications. Uh, build, uh, having such an event like a hackathon, brilliant. That's exactly what you want. There you can attract both kinds of people. You would probably spot good developers, but probably also potential students for the future. Hackathon. Any other, bless you, any other kind of events or things you can do to you know, attract the right people to identify the right people. Your project starts, you really need to hire. <coughs> if you don't have people in place, you have to do all the work. I mean, come on, you... Okay, referral, yeah, yeah, that works, I think, yeah, yeah. 
So quite often, um, I would go to my boss and would say, Stefan, you know, um, you know, I have that position here and I really need someone. Do you have any idea? And he might go like, oh, yeah, you might want to ask this and this person, right? Or <coughs> ask this person for some referral, whatever. And yes, I think that, that works again. That works nicely to um, ask people who you know and who know you, you trust, and depend on their judgment um, in terms of getting, getting the right people. Yes. Anything, any other ways? So, <clears throat> I don't have here a number of solutions. I'm just waiting for, you know, <laughs> to, to throw it towards you. I'm just trying to kind of facilitate and, and trying to get you thinking about that. And, and Acknowledging that this is a really important part of your work, of your future work at least, right? And be, be creative. What, how would you go about that? You now have the money. How would you get the right people? You don't want to be in that position? You will keep on doing your PhD forever, yeah? Who is a PhD student anyways? I, most of you? Yeah. Okay. So, what do you expect? Do you, do you expect to finalize PhD soon, anytime soon? Is that a, a goal? No? No? <laughs> well, I thought that's the whole purpose, right? You're doing a PhD. It's not an, a, you know, an end in itself. You do a PhD in order to do what? To then, what's, what's the next step? Do you, are you aware of what's happening after you're a viva, after, you've, after you are doctor? Any, any plans, anything you want to do beyond that? No? Are you just shy or what? No? These are questions you, you never ask yourself or what is, is it? I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted and, and flattened. Yeah? Yeah, so. So, let me know. Yeah, I, I will do a, a postdoc somehow. Yeah, okay. Why? Um, why? Why would you want to do a postdoc? Yeah. Why I want or why I have to? Why you want to? <laughs> well, it's your choice, right? No one forces you to be a postdoc, I, I believe. I hope. No, uh, it's, I was the same. I, I want to go further in my research. Okay. And as Nisa uh, said, uh, some, uh, some of my uh, ID, I would, I would be not able to, uh, to move on. Fair enough, okay. And I want to, to uh, go in another group and see how it works in another group than mine. Mm -hmm. So I want to pursue an academic career, so mm -hmm. it's the path to go there. Okay, kind of professor that something eventually that's that's kind of attractive to you. Of course, but the problem is I know course. what's the problem to go to the professorship. So it's like you know. But but that's isn't that the easy part? Of what? How get there? No. Well, I think maybe so. It's, no, to get there it's maybe the to, to get the 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 past. No, for example, in my in my faculty, I know that it will not. I will not have a post in my faculty, in, in my university. Yeah, but you're not going to stay there. Years. But you're not going to stay there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the, the key characteristics, I believe, with, with researchers. Yeah. They're not going to stay, you know, you're not doing a PhD in the, in the place and then you do your postdoc in that place and you're going to exactly. be a professor in that place. You're going to move on, right? You're exactly. going to... No, it's, but right. if in my university it's this situation, yeah. no opening for 20 years, sure. I can imagine sure. that in other faculty it will be safe. Right. So I know that the competition is really hard and stuff like this. So I don't <laughs> make, like, I will not uh, oh, uh, uh, make a talk here about my life. So I know what I can get and I know how to get there and maybe I will, you know, get <laughs> yeah. It's hard to explain that to me. No, 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 no. I, I think you have a point there, but, but what I was wondering is, you know, like, you, you go like, of course I'm going to do the, uh, the, the postdoc, and of course I want to be a professor, but why? Why would you want to? Why would you want to? I, I don't. No? Why would I? No, no, it's, the, the thing is, 
there, there was a nice blog post the other day, and, and as you see, I forgot about who wrote it and so on. But the, the, the message there was, we're producing, our system produces too many PhDs, too many postdocs and so on. So there are only a few places, few professorships and so on. But it's kind of like clear, I'm doing my PhD, I'm doing my postdoc, I want to be a professor. But why? There is an article, but there was on uh, a, a magazine, uh, Economic Economics. Right. Okay. How about the display of the internet? Yes. We are producing like yes. thousands of PhDs, more than what's actually required, yep. and there are only two countries, India and Brazil, that mm -hmm. are actually calling. Right. Right. The rest is just... Right. So there's a brain drain and there are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you, you, you have nailed it. So the, the, the thing there really is, what I'd like to motivate you is asking yourself, do you really want to go that way? Do you really want to become a professor eventually? It's not that obvious. I mean, there are a number of ways how you can, um, you know, be creative, contribute, having impact, becoming famous and rich and beautiful and whatnot else, right? Um, and all I'm saying is, I guess, don't just take it for a given and, and kind of default, oh yeah, I'm going to do a postdoc and become a professor one day. Why? It's sometimes the, the, most, the hardest part there really is to identify what you really want. What, what are you good at and what, what can you contribute? So I for myself, just coming back to the topic and to the original idea, I figured for myself, you know, I'm not a good researcher, very simple because by, by conventional standards, how, how, how does someone judge, I mean there's a committee and judges, will you get the professorship or not? What do they do? They look up your, at your publication list, at the length, and then they say size doesn't matter, at the length, and at how many you know, high impact journals and whatnot else. That's, that's just silly, I'm sorry, but that's really silly and I think we should overcome that system judging people based on the length of their publication list and how many high-impact publications they have. You well, are... The peer -to -peer system is the only way you can evaluate scientific work. But there's no God telling that my work is better than yours. If, if, if people continue to argue like that, then nothing will change. And I'm, I'm trying to suggest an alternative reality where we measure people by a number of, of KPIs, of, of, of key performance indicators, which is, on the one hand, of course, publications Yes, that's one KPI, but it's not the only one. There are others. They're harder to measure. I give you that. They're harder to measure. There are things like, what's your standing in the community? How many open source projects have you funded or contributed to? How many events have you been doing? Are you, you know, have you been serving on PCs and OCs and have you been doing that or that event? There are things like, what do your students say about you? or your you know, teammates, your peers, your whatever. There are a number of KPIs I could imagine that you could take into account, but I'm claiming that the current system, the establishment, is simply lazy. Simply lazy and sticks with what is the easiest to measure, and that is how long is your publication list and what are the most important values there? Yes, whatever. They ask the people to send the five best publications yep. for them, not yep. for the. Yes. So they are and they have to rate the publication, mm -hmm. and they have also to send some uh, teaching. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, yep. Five stuff yep. like this and. Very important thing: show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, wrapping up now because I think slowly we're right. we're getting over time. Um, I think the most important thing, if you remember the compass and you know, remember being nosy, trying to explain your stuff, trying to be sustainable and, and, uh, and work hard uh, and don't forget to party. Uh, think of your work-life balance so that you don't burn out with, with uh, 35 or whatever. <laughs> or sometimes a bit, a bit later, depending on when you, when you have started. I'm 37 now, so you know, still uh, when I got that invitation it was addressed as a young researcher, I felt kind of like, you know, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, but, uh, yeah. but that's just a tool. You can or can, you can choose to, to apply or not. Uh, but think about what you really want in life. And I guess the rest will then come into place. 
and yeah, may the funding be with you. <coughs> Thank you. Alrighty.